Um, Jenny Patient from Sheffield Climate Alliance and Green Home Sheffield, and that's the sort of leaping off point, really. Um, I, assuming perhaps that we won't get much happening from central government at the moment, and people are saying local authorities are somewhere that is a pressure point at the moment. I'm really a campaigner. I have the chance to make a presentation to the ruling group on our council in December, and I, I'm just looking for some sort of some sparks of inspiration of you know sort of what can we best engage them with we, we're trying to engage them around a jobs and skills agenda in a way and social co-benefits which i think have been very eloquently outlined tonight um you know and organizationally and in terms of campaigning you know can you guys offer me anything that i can help in talking to our council and would anyone like to come with me from tonight as well? Thank you. <laughs> can I go first? Because um, in a way, we, we can do this together because uh, Jenny and I are both involved with Zero Carbon Yorkshire. And I think sort of the local, that local identity and, join, and learning from authorities within your region is quite a powerful influence. And uh, obviously, we're starting to do that with, through Zero Carbon Yorkshire uh, at the moment with New Build, with Passive House. But in a way, the next step is, is learning about retrofit, which we've started to do. So I, I, can't, I can't give you that because you already know that, Jenny, but I would bring that to the, in a way, that the fact we do things regionally and start to build at a, a regional level um, with local politics is a way that we can perhaps drive, in the same way as we're driving now, starting to drive Passive House um, within Yorkshire, some of the authorities that sort of have thought about it and gone to nearly Passive House, and they're suddenly realising actually that that doesn't make any sense because they're seeing other authorities who are doing it, and it's you know so learning from each other. So I, I think there's somewhere in there those lessons that, uh, for me is what's important. But you know that already, so because <laughs> we work together on that. Um, let me know the date, and I'll try to make <laughs> it. Um, on the, um, I actually also have a question for people here, if I may, in a minute. Um, on the, um, what, what else to do is, as you say, I think what is important is if we start talking about the co-benefits and that we start collecting the evidence about thermal comfort, health, um, the NHS impact. Um, you know, there was, um, uh, in, with the previous coalition government, there was a boiler on prescription pilot study and I have no idea what actually happened with that. So um, the other thing as well is that um, with retrofit and particularly deep retrofit, um, there is evidence that there's much less um, people who uh, ha are in rent errors as well. So again, that would be something that the council would be very interested in and also they can afford their bills again and you know, there's all sorts of knock-on effects as well and less maintenance of properties because not, they're not underheating mold growth issues because if it's retrofitted, you shouldn't have those issues. Could I, am I, Chair, am I allowed to ask one question which comes a little bit back to the E-rating you talked about? Does anyone here know or have their own house uh, EPC done? Yeah. And do you know, can, can I hear some numbers of what the EPC, do you remember the EPC rating? Yes, um, I had the house done in, two years ago and it was 38% F. Yes, F, yeah. And it's 87% B now. Okay, so Which from... I think it's probably a bit flattering, but... <laughs> from F to B, anybody else? D now. D now, and you were? Oh, so it's now, so it's not retrofitted yet. D, yeah? Yeah, it is retrofitted. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. How's it gone from E to C? E to C, yeah. So, um, anybody else wants to? I think mine was E to C. E to C as well. So, what I guess I wanted to say is, I think also with the council, but with most of us, we don't really know what E, C, B means. And when we have a policy that comes in and says, um, from 2018, mm. landlords can't let... Um, officially can't let any dwelling that is E-rated or below. E-rated is pretty bad. My house in London was D-rated and all it had was an efficient boiler from 2006, loft insulation and UPVC double glazing and that was D-rated. So there was no other insulation, there were significant energy bills um, every year. When we then did the Green Deal it went up to B-rating as well. Um, and I think it's also trying to unpick some of those policies that people, we understand what it means as well, because we think, oh, that's great. It's not very energy inefficient. Actually, an E-rating is really pretty bad. I mean, it's very low um, and very high energy bills. Can I just say, be, be, be really mindful on 
sole reliance on SAP ratings for their houses too, because um, yeah. we look, did a, a SAP assessment of our house when I moved in with my wife and I rented my house out. Now, on the SAP recommended lists, it recommended me installing a um, condensing boiler before doing any external wall retrofit, which means that if I were to do follow those measures and go for the highest score, if I'd done the boiler for, first, it would be oversized. So I cringe when I hear about uh, condensing boilers being installed mass scale because I know that 10 years down the line, if they're doing external wall insulation, those boilers are oversized, which means they're, which means they're cycling more, which means the, um, the servicing costs are going to be higher, which means that they're not actually going to be getting into condensing mode and they're going to be operating at be between 60 and 70%. So just be mindful of that. Looking at the uh, presentation so far, the retrofits seem to be quite expensive, the ones that we've looked at. So as a person who is a homeowner, if I look at this as, as retrofit, when do you think it's going to become viable on an individual level to do a retrofit to the level we're told we should do to do the whole thing? Um, in terms of the finance availability, we're already stretching mortgages because people don't have the money to pay them on the old scale. So are we talking about a, a master, a, a major change for the whole sort of idea of housing and uh, the viability of it? I mean, it's, it, it's a very worthy destination, but I'm just thinking about the short-term measures of, you know, do I go around sellotaping the gaps in, in the doors? Where do I start, stop, finish? And, is it something that I can do or is it something I should wait for government legislation and somebody else to move? I think at the moment for the, so the average house that all of us got, there are a few limited things we can do to make some difference when we're doing upgrades to houses anyway. Uh, but at the moment, uh, overall, it should be done because we need to change our, our energy consumption. That energy fundamentally is still pretty relatively cheap compared to the, the damage it's causing by its use. Um, so there's a disincentive for individuals to do as much as we know as a nation we to do, which comes back to Chris's point, I think, that the only way this is going to start happening at any scale is if there's government action, both on, not just on legislation, but on finance. The Green Deal was a flop because it was set up to make money for finances, not to actually do the job that it was designed, supposedly designed for. So it needs, you know, rather than uh, governments investing billions in Chinese state nuclear to invest that money in actually paying for houses to be retrofitted, I would suggest. A couple of issues there. I mean, I'd say also when, when you create mechanisms, you have to know what you've achieved. And we don't have any system knowing what you've achieved other than the SAP ratings, which I think we all recognise are very inaccurate. Um, so you have to tie, if you're trying to create a funding mechanism, I mean, I would stand by what I said about government. In the end, I, I think that's what the state's for, partly. But that's an old-fashioned view, I know. But, um, but in terms of creating private mechanisms, and I've got a discussion coming up with a, um, a uh, building society on looking at whether we can create packages, but they have to lend against a standard. And there aren't any standards at the moment. We're looking at trying to join together a standard, which is actually the, um, the, the ACB carbon light, uh, scheme has a, is creating a certification standard for retrofit, uh, assessing risk and also assessing performance. But it's a hard thing to do and being done on a shoestring. But if we can tie that together with a funding mechanism, we might be able to create a package system there, or at least you can borrow against. But we don't know. But the, the, it doesn't exist, basically. There was a very interesting model I saw in Holland uh, to a presentation um, where you can buy a retrofit off the shelf. So you go into a shop and you say, I, I want that retrofit. So I want an extension and I want to retrofit this standard. And you would buy a box, in effect. And you say, that's what it would cost. It would cost me £50,000. And you go and pay for it. And it is a fixed price. Because one of the other issues is we don't, don't generally know how much things are going to cost. Because you know, with building, there's usually overruns. As, you know, it, it never actually is fixed. So, and the, the case they made was, well, let's give you a fixed thing. So you will get that, you will get that for that. Uh, you know, if you go and buy any other product, you pay you know, £20,000 for a car, or if you do. But you know, whatever you pay, you, you know what you pay for what you get. But in building, you rarely do, because it's never, it's never fixed. So that's, that's another issue there with retrofit. Yeah, so. um, Bath and North East Somerset uh, Council on their, on their website have 
um, you know, at the age of your property, you click on that, and then it gives you uh, a shopping list of uh, approaches that you can you can do to retrofit your property. And it's a fantastic tool, but it's embedded really deep inside their website. And you know, there's there's a role there, I think, to actually. <coughs> Uh, provide some capacity building to, to, to homeowners so they, they're more aware of the options they have. Yeah, um, in retrofit in, in buildings, we're always looking at insulation and so on. But to me, it's lighting that is the issue, not just in buildings, but across outside lighting, <coughs> street lighting. No one really looks at that as where we should really be saving a lot of energy. I mean, I know this is a sustainable building, but it's overlit internally. Go into the I just happen to go to the toilet, and it's massive lights on all the time, <coughs> just for me to have a pee. You know, I mean, and then in here, it's just over the, and it's, you get this, and then I worked a lot in schools and energy efficiency for schools, and schools are made for nighttime use, the lighting systems. So the regulations need to be really, I'm making a question, how are we gonna change the design regulations for architects to follow sustainable lighting, um, <coughs> Like and, and 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 with that, you know, bringing in natural lighting, which would be a nice, nicer place for children to to learn. But we're not doing it. I mean, like, I would say in terms of new buildings and the standards around lighting efficiency, it's not too bad actually. You need to, you need to put in some pretty efficient lighting. What about the issues retrofit? around controls and 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 having lights on all the time? In general, on retrofit, there is very little on standards, other than uh, a little bit on the building recs. Um, and the other thing I would say, because of that, it also means we have a huge skills gap, including in architecture, because. Um, Retrofit is not seen still as a full in, sort of genuine inquiry, architectural inquiry and investigation. I'm glad to say that we do teach it here at the school, <laughs> um, but it actually it's often not even taught, it's all new builds. So, but if you think about the amount of buildings that need to be retrofitted sustainably existing, it makes absolute sense and should be part of our repertoire. Hi, so um, sort of following on from Jenny's question about local councils, what we can ask them to do. Obviously, there's a lot of issues around policy and all these standards and things like that. What, if we were to write to our MP, our local MP, what could we ask them, like a really clear question, what can they do, like one policy change or something that could be made, like it's sort of in simple terms so that we could go away and write a letter and say, um, can you speak up about this? Yeah. Um, I would ask my MP um, to make retrofit an infrastructure policy, so part of, you know, infrastructure, so new power stations, you know, all of that is infrastructure, but retrofit isn't, and it must be. And then hopefully, you agree with me, Chris, or not? <laughs> I, I completely, I, I imagine most people would, um, in the end, it has to be infrastructure spending, yeah, um, and I, I, I'm not in the company of quite a few academics and, and somebody who spends most time being reasonably practical and running a business, but I think the numbers are something like right. Um, the uh, calculation was done on the, what the 20 odd million homes at 40,000, you know, it's about 600 billion, the infrastructure costs we need to spend between now and 2050, very roughly. Uh, that's what we need to spend on retrofit in this country, say, if we spent 40,000 a house, you know, um, um, issues of scale, obviously. Um, so we could be doing that, if you divide that by 35, that's possible. What are we going to spend on Hinkley? And on, um, yeah, and on, uh, yeah. exactly, I was going Somewhere to say. between 20 <laughs> and 35 billion, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. you know, we're, we're in the same ballpark, you know, so yeah. we, we could We might not be. need Hinkley. Hmm? <laughs> no, we don't, we don't need Hinkley, so we save yeah. there. And all the other, and the Chinese one, and all the other infrastructure we're going to have to build for energy. So, you know, it, it, it makes, it begins to sort of, it's in the same ballpark. It's not, mm. it's, it's not crazy stuff. Yeah. And I would ask my MP, uh, I think, just to upgrade building regs to make passive house a standard. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> um, Just leading on from one of the points the gentleman made about the light bulbs and how um, energy companies were allowed to send these things out wholesale. I mean, I'd ask your MP um, if there's a, you know some sort of mechanism that could be implemented where communities could get into some form of carbon offsetting themselves. So if let's say there's a there's a, a national uh, standard per you know of how much carbon per person emits per year, if a community can get together and establish 
um, you know, for a set population, you can save this much carbon. That has a value. So that will have a value to other polluters around the world that want to offset their carbon, and therefore it has a monetary value. And that can be that can be used in a negotiation to acquire more funding potentially. Um, you know, when you think about it in the future, as we go towards 2050, and, we're, and we have to make the, uh, the savings in our carbon um, to make, you know, to, to reach the restraints which are put on us by the, the Paris Agreement, you know, you can imagine some form of rationing system which is going to come into play with, with carbon emissions. I mean, they did it in the Second World War, you know, with food. So, just throwing that out there. Okay, last question of the evening. This, this might be quite a quick one, probably mostly for Jonathan. Uh, we've heard about the affordability of retrofit, but there's, there's also that desirability, that people wanting to do it. Have you noticed anything from the fantastic school kids we saw from your Wilkinson primary working on their parents, either, either consciously or unconsciously, and perhaps driving the desirability factor of retrofit as well? Um. So not specifically on FASFAS projects, but there are some great examples of uh, schools uh, that have won awards through the Ashton <coughs> Awards Sustainable Energy, where they've actually worked with schools, uh, got children engaged in actually changing behaviour. They've they found in schools that you got the biggest improvements, not when you persuaded the teachers what to do, but the children, and then actually children going home and talking to their parents. I don't think it's got as far as retrofit, but it's certainly got as, as far as getting people to turn off things uh, and get better light bulbs and things. So I do, you know, passionately believe that, you know, change can start with children. Uh, they, they get it. They really do. Yeah. And they enjoy it as well. That's the other thing. <laughs> all it remains for me to say is to thank very much indeed all of our speakers tonight. Uh, it's been an absolutely fantastic panel, um, hugely erudite, a huge amount of information and uh, a lot of very interesting dialogue. So I'd like to thank you all in the customary way, if we may.